Good morning and happy Sabbath from the Raleigh Seventh-day Adventist Church. My name is Michael Jenkins and today I'll be giving you a message of some of the lessons that I learned in uh, 2020. Uh, we were originally slated to have this recorded and uh, sent out for the New Year's, just before the New Year's actually, but unfortunately due to circumstances we weren't able to get the message out, we weren't able to get the recording, things happen. As is in the style of 2020, uh, as it still feels like it is, things didn't work out exactly as we expected. So, instead, tonight, I'll be telling you a few of the lessons that I learned during 2020, uh, and I hope that you'll stay with us and enjoy something new from the Lord. Let's pray to begin our worship. Heavenly Father, we ask you, Lord, that your presence would be here with us today but also, Lord, that your presence would be with those who are watching. There are many of us tonight that are hurting, that have been hurt by the circumstances that we've lived through in 2020. Help us, Lord, to focus on the things that we have to learn, the lessons that you've taught us in this very difficult year. I pray, Lord, that what it is that you've taught me will be a blessing to those who are watching at home. And I pray that the right person will get the right message at the right time. We ask this in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 2020, right? It's been an interesting year, if we can call it that. Um, lots of stuff has happened. We had the pandemic, we had riots, we had a very contentious election, had a lot of really, really crazy stuff going on. But I'm not here to talk about that. We're going to talk about something a lot simpler, a lot easier. Something that I think will bring a little bit of joy to you. Earlier this year, at the beginning of this year, we started the winter session at, N, uh, at MJA. Or rather, we started the, uh, the spring session. And at that time, I had already learned a lot of things about how to bring together education and Bible teaching. Um, but the Lord opened my eyes to some things that I had never seen before, and I want to share those with you today. There are two things that I want to share with you. Now, this might be a two-part series, depending on whether or not the pastor will let me come back, because today I'm going to be talking to you about two of the things I learned by teaching algebra. And then if I get to come back, I can teach you two of the things that the Lord taught me through biology. So, to begin, we want to open our Bibles. It's really important that we open our Bibles so that we can get the Lord to come and bless what we're doing. So first, if you would turn to Exodus 25, 8. And as I still consider myself a bit of a teacher, we're going to use a whiteboard instead of a PowerPoint. Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. The Lord says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, as you probably are aware, having watched, because you're watching this right now, the Seventh-day Adventists love the sanctuary. And I personally, I love the sanctuary. There's so many beautiful messages that you can teach from, from the sanctuary. You can talk about the feast days, and you can talk about them as a timeline to the crucifixion of Christ, and you can also talk about them as a timeline from the crucifixion of Christ to the end of time, where instead of the Lord coming from heaven to tabernacle with us, the Lord comes from heaven to take us to tabernacle with him. You can talk about Christ's life as it's ex expressed through the sanctuary. And you can talk about salvation, you can talk about redemption, just about every topic that you can think of is embedded in the sanctuary. But there's one that you probably didn't know. So I want to talk about something really quick called the Order of Operations. The Order of Operations is a, a rule set that we use in mathematics and it's critical to understanding how algebra works. It's one of the first things that you learn when you start, start taking the class for algebra. And that's because we get into all kinds of crazy uh, expressions that have to be graphed. And you need to know what to do first so that you can make sure that your graph matches the information that you're given. And most of you, 
when you went to public school or you went to private school, you'll have learned some acronym to, uh, to remember this. Usually it's PEMDAS. And this particular acronym is Please Excuse My Dear Aunt Sally. And it's just a mnemonic device to help you remember the order that you're supposed to do things. Parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, add, subtract. Simple. Let me go through that again, just in case, like, like me, many of you might not be have a real good grip on mathematics. So let's try again. Parentheses, exponents, multiplication, divide, add, subtract. Very simple. Now, as a Seventh-day Adventist, I believe in the, tenth, the Ten Commandments. And of the Ten Commandments, the Ninth Commandment tells us that we should not bear false witness. So if you bear with me, I'm practicing my dad jokes, I don't have a, a dear Aunt Sally. So I can't actually say this because it's bearing false witness. But I have a better idea. As I was preparing to teach the students the order of operations, I don't know why, but the Lord brought the sanctuary to my mind. And so I started to piece together what it is that the Lord was trying to tell me, and as I did, my eyes grew wider, and my heart grew wider, and I finally saw what it was that he was trying to teach me. So let me give you a way to remember the sanctuary, every single piece of furniture in there, and the order of operations at the same time. So we're going to back up here, and we're going to start something new. We're going to start the order of the sanctuary. Now a lot of you are probably seeing where I'm going, but I want you to bear with me because I think this is going to be really interesting for you. So just like you've seen in many, many PowerPoint slides on many, many evangelistic series, we're going to set up what you might remember as the sanctuary. We have the outer, the outer court with the wall around it. We have the, the holy place. And we have the most holy place contained in one central building that is divided into two compartments. Now, I wish I could use more than black markers, but it's not transferring real well to the video. So just bear with me. On one side, we're going to talk about math. And on the other, we're going to talk about the Bible or the biblical structures that are in there. So at the entrance to the sanctuary, you have the gate. There's only one way in and one way out of the sanctuary, and that is through the gate. So nobody goes in under the walls or over the walls. The walls are high enough that no one can, you're not supposed to scale them. You shouldn't be scaling them. But the walls are high enough that you can't see in and no one can see out. After this, there is the altar of sacrifice where the animal uh, offerings and the other offerings would be sacrificed. We have the labor of washing. So let me write these down. Then on the inside, we have the menorah or the candlestick. Give it seven. On the other side, we have the table of showbread. In the center, we have our altar of incense. And then in the most holy place, we have our Ark of the Covenant. It has two angels that I'm going to draw really poorly on either side of the top of the box called the mercy seat. So let's add those in over here. Our table of showbread. And the altar of incense. And then the ark. So again, the process is really straightforward, and we all pretty much know that. We start at the gate, 
The first thing we do is we go to the altar of sacrifice where the sinner would meet with the hot with the priests, put their hands on the head of a lamb, confess their sins, the lamb would be slain, the blood would be taken into the sanctuary, but the body would be burned out here. The labor of washing is the second step where the priests would clean themselves before entering into the holy place. Inside the holy place we have the candlestick, we have the table of showbread, and we have the altar of incense. And then finally we have the Ark of the Covenant. Just about every Seventh-day Adventist, I hope, knows this. It is fundamental to what we believe in as Seventh-day Adventists because not only do we view the earthly sanctuary that was given to Moses for him to build, that just like in our, our verse here, Exodus 25, 8, tells us that God wanted to dwell with us and so we needed to build a sanctuary for him. Not only do we believe in the earthly sanctuary, but we believe that this was given to Moses as a model of the heavenly sanctuary to teach us about our relationship with God, to teach us about salvation, about the cost of redemption, to teach us many, many, many things, and to teach us one more thing today. So we talked about our biblical pieces of furniture. We've got the gate, the altar uh, of sacrifice. We've got the labor of washing, the candlestick, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the Ark of the Covenant. Now, here's where things take a left turn. We want to learn order of operations. And so some of you are probably already seeing what's there, but let me walk you through it one step at a time. The first thing we do in the order of operations is parentheses. Now, parentheses are also known in our textbook, it actually said gathering symbols, which is not just parentheses, but brackets as well. The parentheses and brackets go on either side of numbers, and the, op the, the operations inside those parentheses must be done first before anything else is done. Parentheses must be completed first. And so, don't we have an entrance? Everyone must gather before going into the sanctuary. You must gather before you enter the sanctuary, so we have our first step. The second step under our order of operations is exponents, which is going to be any number, it's not a number, any number with another number above it. That's the exponent that I just circled. Now, an exponents, exponents are also known as powers. Nine to the second power, for example. We see our second step into the sanctuary. We have the altar of sacrifice where the blood is shed. And we have the labor of wash, washing where the water is. We see two new pieces. The power of the blood and the power of the water. Our powers are there. All right, so at this point, my brain was clicking and thinking, there's something here. There's absolutely something here. And as we go, you'll see the same thing. So we did parentheses, or gathering symbols. You gather before you enter the sanctuary. Powers. The power of the blood. The power of the water. We move into the next part of the sanctuary. And we have our next step. Our next step is going to be multiplication and division. So I'm going to put those symbols up here, the times and the divine. Well, as I was looking at it, the first thing that struck me is the table of showbread. The table of showbread is divided into two stacks, or rather the bread that's on the table of showbread is divided into two stacks of six. There's division in there. Okay, but what about multiplication? Well, if we go over to the candlestick and we look at the oil, the oil, when it's burned, releases its potential energy. It multiplies its energy. It multiplies also the light in the sanctuary as it's the only source of light within that building. So we have the next step. We have the division of the bread and the multiplication of the light. 
Now we can move to the last step. Addition and subtraction. And both of these you'll find when you look at the Ark of the Covenant. When we get to the Ark of the Covenant, we're now standing in the presence of the Lord. There's only one person who can stand in the presence of the Lord and not be destroyed. And that's Jesus Christ, the only human that can stand before the Lord. Our relationship with Jesus Christ allows us to wear his merits like a white robe. As he took on our sin, we took on his righteousness. And so here we have the subtraction of our sins and the addition of Christ's righteousness. And let me roll through this one more time. Gathering symbols, powers, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. We gather before we enter the sanctuary. We recognize the power of the blood, the power of the water. We move into the sanctuary, the multiplication of the light, the division of the bread, and we move past into the most holy place with the Ark of the Covenant where we have the addition of Christ's righteousness and the subtraction of our sinfulness. Now, this was a huge blessing to me when I found it out. And I tried to push it really hard for the students so that they would be able to take this and this would be the device by which they remember a rule in mathematics where we can connect the divine with an institution that often is considered to be secular, that often fights in and of itself against religion. Here we have these two things working together that teach the same truth. But just like the Bible, there's a truth on the surface, and there are many, many truths below that. The minute we start digging, we find more and more beautiful truths. Now, this was absolutely gorgeous to me when I first saw it. And I don't really know who it's for, to be honest. It was given to me in a classroom, so I taught it to my students. I knew it was important, and I shared it with other teachers that I've met, and they felt that it was important. But many people said they'd never heard anyone talk about this from, from the pulpit before. So here I am. I don't know if this is a message for you, but someone needs to hear this. It's always enjoyable when a difficult topic like math overlaps with something that's important to us or something that we're interested in, like the sanctuary. But there are other places that the Bible overlaps with mathematics. And there are lots of examples that people have given over the, the, the time that I've seen sermons where they talk about math and the Bible and, and prophecy and dates and things like that. But we're going to do one more thing and we're going to do it right here on the board and it will be, again, very simple. For our second text, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. And most of you already recognize Genesis chapter 3 is the rebellion. Eve eats the apple, gives it to her husband, he eats the apple, they both fall. In verse 9, God comes down and he asks a question. And he says, where are you? Which is a really strange question coming from God. God is omnipresent, he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he knows everything, he is everywhere. How could he not know where Adam was? But when you read it in a different way, God asking, where are you? It wasn't a question for God. He wasn't trying to get information, as we normally do with questions. It was a rhetorical question. It was a question for Adam. Adam needed to ask himself, where am I? And so, we're going to look at another aspect of math from algebra that will relate to this question of where are you. So, much to many people's dread, we are going to be talking about graphing. And most people recognize this. There's a grid that goes with it, but I'm not going to bore you by drawing it all out. 
What I am going to show you is something very interesting that I also have never seen anyone talk about before. Mostly because I think the average person tries to avoid algebra at all costs. So along this we have our x-axis, I'm going to write an x over here, and along here we have our y-axis. Now, number lines are just an x-axis. So we have positive numbers on this side and negative numbers on this side. Our origin is here, and that is represented by two numbers, 0, 0, and those two numbers represent our x and our y coordinate. Some of you are having flashbacks right now. Don't worry, we're not going to get too technical. More of the anatomy of a graph includes the different places that you can end up. So we have the, the first quadrant. We have the second quadrant. We have the third quadrant. And we have the fourth quadrant. Now these quadrants, these quadrants are used to identify where a point might be at any time on the graph. And part of algebra is not just getting a point here, and a point here, and a point here, but connecting those dots based off of the data that you've received. So it's more than just plotting points, it's actually drawing a line. And that's where we run into what's called slope. And slope tells us the direction of a line. And so we can see there's a positive slope and there's a negative slope. But first we need to talk a little bit more about these quadrants because those are reflective of that. In our first quadrant, all of the numbers in this area are going to have two values, an x-coordinate, where they end up on this line, and a y-coordinate, where they end up on this line. So you'll have an x, and you'll have a y-coordinate. Under the second quadrant, you'll get a negative x value, and you'll get a positive y value, because the y, everything above the, the x-axis is positive, everything below is negative. So here we have negative x and a positive y. Well, you can guess the third quadrant, we're going to have two negatives. Negative x, negative y. And then the fourth quadrant is the only, the only, combination, the only combination left that we can have, which is going to be positive x, negative y. Simple, right? Feel like you're back in high school yet? You will. Positive, positive, negative, positive, negative, negative, positive, negative. That is how, or rather, that is all of the anatomy that we see with a graph. Now we want to talk about slope. Let's get rid of our zero, zero origin, but leave the point. And this isn't going to be exact, but let's plot out a few numbers and we'll ask a question here, and get some spiritual interpretation. I'll get four lines, that'll give us enough to get a slope that goes through all four coordinates. So we'll do the most basic mathematical slope that we can do. When the slope equals one. When the slope equals one, this number can be converted into, or is the same as, 1 over 1, which means we have uh, an x value of 1 and a y value of 1. Our next point is here. And we can continue extrapolating that out. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Now, the minute we have two points, we can connect those two points and make a line. But we've got four, so we'll just go ahead and connect those and it keeps going. So, in traditional algebraic fashion, I'm going to write the equation here on the line of slope equals positive 1. Now, what happens if we turn this into a negative 1? A negative 1 then converts to negative 1 over 1 or, that's not right, 
a negative 1 over 1. Which is to say, the x value goes down 1, or rather the, the y value goes down 1, as the x value goes down, or goes up 1. So here we have positive 1, negative 1. That's too high. There's our 1 there. Positive 1, negative 1. Positive 1, negative 1. Positive 1, negative 1. And so we get a slope that's going in the exact opposite direction. It looks pretty complicated, but it begs us a simple question. I want you to pay attention to this up here. And I want you to pay attention to these other ones, half as much. What do you notice about these three that is different with this one? If you're thinking it's the negative signs, you're absolutely right. That's what we're looking at. In our second quadrant, the x is a negative value. In the third quadrant, our x and y have a negative value. In our fourth quadrant, the y is a negative value. Slope and our coordinate plane helps determine where we are. Which is the same question that God asked at the very beginning. When we look at all of this information together, we can see there is only one direction that is positive in both x and y values. Here, there's still a negative quality. Here, there's still a negative quality even though the x value goes up. Here, both values are dropping substantially. Now that question, as I was thinking and teaching this to the students, that question kept bothering me. There's, there's something between them, there's something connecting, some connective tissue between the coordinate plane and this question about where you are. And then, slowly washed over me. When we talk about the path that God wants us to walk on, it is positive in every way. Maybe not experientially for us. This year has been a really hard year for not just you, but also for me and everybody. It's been a tough year. But God wants us to progress. He wants us to move in positive directions. There is only one direction that is both positive in altitude and long longitude. One that moves us forward and up. And so God asks Adam, and expanding on that, he asks all of us, where are you? If we think about ourselves, you can put in whatever variables you want for x and y, but they are things that God desires of us. And then you can plot yourself, you can take bullet points and put yourself somewhere on this graph. But it's not just a flat plane. You and all of us experience time. And so over time, we change. Over time, more points can be put on the graph. And as more points are put on the graph, a line can be drawn. The question is, which direction is that line going in? Where are you going? First, where are you on the coordinate plane? Maybe you're dead way down here. Negative and negative. Maybe negative in attitude, negative in service. You don't like helping people, and you just cannot force yourself to do it. The slope matters. Even if you start negative, a slope, a positive slope, will bring you up into the positives. And even if you start really high up in the positives, a negative slope will draw you down to where you don't want to be. So you can see that there are many, many lessons that we have still to learn from algebra. Covering this again, we're looking at a chart that tells us the slope of a line in algebra 
But more than that, it's asking that unique question that God asked in Genesis. Where are you? Are you on your way to where I want you to be? Or are you on your way to being lost? Sometimes it's a difficult question to answer, to ask. But one of the things I like to say in my math class is that math is hard, but God is good. Sometimes life is hard, but God is good. No matter where you are on this chart, the Lord has a slope for you that will draw you to Him. No matter where you are on this chart, no matter where a point falls, if the slope is positive and positive, it will end up in the positive the first, quad, uh, the first quadrant on the coordinate plane. So the last thing I want to share with you, the very last thing, is something supremely simple, but something that a lot of people tend to miss. One of the things that makes math possible is demonstrated in this simple equation. Now, this equation is very, very basic math. And some people today, in modern age, have started to question whether or not 1 over plus 1 actually equals 2. But the basis of found, the, the foundation of all math depends on the stability of this equation. Every other equation depends on the stability of math. Math can only exist in a stable universe, in a place where God has set the rules and the boundaries and said, no matter how many times you run this equation, 1 plus 1, it will always equal 2. God created the universe in such a way that we can understand this. And the math that brought us to the moon, the math that we use to look at black holes, because we can't actually see them, we see the light bending around it. All of the math that we use is based off of this foundational principle. Everything is stable. There are violent things happening out in space. Black holes, quasars, supernovas, all these really, really things that we don't even fully understand yet. But all of that is based off of a stable universe. God created our universe for us to explore, for us to experience. And He did that because He loves us. Because He wants us to explore His creation. And tonight, I hope that, rather this morning, I hope that you will see math and algebra with a new perspective. See them not as intimidating or frightening, but as an extension of God trying to reveal himself to us through every avenue that's available to him. We've, it's, it's often talked about that God reveals himself through nature. God reveals himself through his word. He reveals himself through our interactions with other people. But it's very rarely said that God reveals himself through math, even though it's easy to see when it's presented. So one last time. We started this, this morning by talking about the sanctuary. And we remembered our order of operations using the sanctuary. So we start with the gate, or the gathering symbols. We then go to the altar of sacrifice, and the labor of washing. And those are our powers, the power of the blood, the power of, of the water, or baptism. Next, we go into the holy place, and we have the candlestick on one side and the table of showbread on the other. Multiplication of the light, division of the bread. We move into the most holy place. We have the Ark of the Covenant. Addition of Christ's righteousness. Subtraction of our sins. Second, we talked about coordinate planes. And we asked, answered that question. 
Where are you? From Genesis 3.9. We looked at how there are four coordinate planes, or there's four quadrants on the coordinate plane, but only one of those is a double positive. One of those is truly positive. Every other slope, or every other, every other quadrant, is negative in some way. God wants us to be positive. He wants us to be moving in that upward direction. And so we learned about the differences between a positive slope and a negative slope. And we also learned that no matter where you are, God has a positive slope for you. Because He wants you to be in that positive area. Finally, we talked about a stable universe. Something that a loving, caring God who's interested in getting to know us personally would establish and did establish. The simplest thing no matter how many times you run it by, is what holds this universe together. The love of God expressed through algebra and math. Now, like I said when I started, 2020 has been a very difficult year. It's been very, very hard. Even though it's been hard, the Lord has been teaching you lessons all along. There are things that He desperately wants you to learn. There are experiences that he desperately wants you to have. And sometimes, like with Jonah, it was necessary for the Lord to allow some bad things to happen to you. To get you to be right where you need to be. So tonight, or this morning, as we finish up, I'd like you to pray with me. That the Lord would show you his loving kindness through the things that you find difficult in your life. And I hope that you will be able to share this with other people to show them math, well, it's hard. God is good. So let's pray together to finish. Heavenly Father, tonight we've been blessed with two lessons that you've taught me. Now, Lord, I commit it to the people who have come in and watched, that you would help them to find an opportunity to share those with someone, that it would help them in some special way, that they would be able to see you where they've never seen you before, or they might have some hope of turning their life around, or maybe even just some stability some hope, some promise of stability. I ask, Lord, that whatever it is that the people need to hear, they hear. Because I don't know what people need. I'm still struggling to understand what it is that I need. But you, Lord, have the ability and the power and the knowledge to give everyone exactly what they need. And I ask, Lord, for this blessing in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.